Um, cool. Um, okay, so this is just a quick lightning talk. Um, it was about some experiments that we did in the IFI about looking at um, a collection of a couple of hundred standard definition um, ProRes within the MOV container um, files to FFV1 and Matroska and some of the conclusions we kind of kind of came to. Um, so why would you want to normalize uh, lossy video to lossless? Um, I, I think it's quite uncontroversial to take uncompressed or lossless video and migrate it to a lossless format. Um, doing it with lossy um, is maybe a little bit more controversial. Um, Perhaps FFV1 or JPEG 2000 or something like that might already be the designated preservation master format for a whole bunch of your files. Like in the IFI, for film scans, we migrate our uh, DPX to um, FFV1 and Matroska via raw cooked. Um, our uncompressed YUV um, tape migrations as well are also migrated to FFV1 and Matroska. So we thought, let's just at least um, investigate this um, you know, will we use FFV1 or will we just maintain ProRes uh, within MOV? Um, also, yeah, maybe folks might want to move away from proprietary formats and FFV1 and Matroska for, you know, we spent four years talking about how um, great it is um, as a preservation file format. And perhaps you might, um, you know, think you might want to safeguard your collections in some way by, by doing this. Um, and some of the dangers here are like, just what if some of the significant properties are lost and even finding out what are the significant properties. Um, how do you validate that the normalization was correct? Because I think anytime you do these kinds of file format migrations, um, you have to be really, really careful. And I think if you, unless you have a really, really good reason, you might be better off staying away from it. Um, like is frame MD5 validation enough? Like any test that we did, um, like the frame MD5 is matched, matched and like running it through our Python scripts that we'd use for uncompressed video, they all said like your files um, have the same um, uh, decoded checksums as the original. So that was all grand and it, was, it would show up as lossless. Um, so that, that was all okay. Um, I mean, there's the usual file size increase that comes from taking lossy files and transforming them into lossless. For ProRes, we're, uh, this isn't, wasn't like super scientific, but in general, it was like around a 30 to 40% increase in file size. Um, and so yeah, it was um, Raylene Casey, Gavin Martin and myself um, did a bunch of tests on these things. And one of the issues was like um, a lot of the files that we had were created um, on Macs. They were created with like Final Cut Pro, 7, um, Blackmagic Media Express or Asia Control Room. And uh, there was a, pretty much all of these files had clean aperture metadata in there. And this is almost like where um, we st stopped investigating at this point, because what we realized was any of these files that had the clean aperture metadata, um, they only displayed, the only, the only way you could actually um, render a file um, that obeyed a bunch of uh, this metadata here was by playing it back in QuickTime Player. Um, if it was in VLC, <coughs> Um, this was like your original ProRes file or in FFplay, MPV or whatever. Um, it, it would just ignore the, these values. And these are essentially just defining crops. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, numbers going on here, but when they're all kind of smashed together, the 41472 divided by 59 multiplied by the pixel aspect ratio, 59 by 54, you just produce a number called 768. When you divide 768 by 576, and that's like what it should actually display as. It's 4 by 3, 1.33. It's all fine. Um, and you can see here, this is in QuickTime Player. The image goes over to the edge. But if you look at it in VLC, and it would be the same. This would be the FFV1 file if it was viewed in VLC as well. You can see those. Uh, I picked an absolutely terrible image. I apologize. But um, you can see there's some. You, you can't see. Um, there's, trust me, there's eight, but eight pixels of black padding on either side here. Um, and if you look at um, like you know uh, broadcast requirements, uh, like you know uh, uh, look at the video uh, distribute or submitting standard definition video to the BBC or something, they're kind of acknowledging that in, in Rec 601 video, um, you're only supposed to show like 703 pixels or such. Um, uh, an increased difficulty here is with these values here, um, like in Rec 601, I think they define the pixel aspect ratio as 59 divided by 50, 54. If the 720 pixels wide are, if, if there's like a crop down to about, I don't know, it's like 
rounded up to 703 or so, you will get a four by three. But by default, uh, when you're encoding, um, the crop is pretty much ignored. The 59 divided by 54 is, is um, applied to the 720. And it, in, it produces 786 pixels wide, which then produces an aspect ratio of 1.36 to 4. Um, like previously, like Age of Control Room and Blackmagic Media Express would um, just use a different pixel aspect ratio, 16 by 15, and it would at least show up as 4 by 3, but you would still have those black bars. Um, and like the larger question of whether or not these things should be cropped upon display or not, or whether this even matters, uh, that's probably another lightning talk, but the thing is, um, the tool that created this file, um, I think it was intended to display at, like this in QuickTime Player. Um, and it doesn't survive the normalization, um, I would say, to, to, to most containers if you're um, within the FF um, or you know, using open source tools. OK, so I don't want to just like, come up here and, co and complain about these tools or anything like that. I want to talk about um, like, what happened next and like, all the um, like mis mistakes I made, I guess. So I figured um, from um, hearing about the work of the Austrian Media Tech over the years and just um, no time to wait and stuff, like, you know, you can just sponsor um, open source developers um, to fix things. Um, the IFI did it um, a few times, uh, mostly with uh, Jerome Martinez. We found there was issues um, with analyzing digital cinema packages within media info, so we sponsored the improvements, and we also contributed to Raw Cooked as well. Um, so I figured um, Paul B. Mahal is always asking people, what do you want to fix in FFmpeg? And so I said I would get in touch with him, and then he kept asking me over and over again, why haven't you emailed me? I haven't received a mail, and um, eventually we resolved this off list, and he was super nice about everything. Um, and so what I've done in the meantime is just look through um, where are these issues actually reported on the appropriate bug trackers. So actually, uh, Carl Uygen, um, uh, a few years ago, raised this ticket, so there was no need for me to make a new one. So there was cropping defined. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. These values, the clean aperture values, they can be mapped to Matroska. There's like pixel width um, values, and it's just um, the mapping isn't available right now, but it totally can be if uh, some development is sponsored. And even if they are there, um, they don't display in VLC right now. But again, that can totally be fixed. Um, this was me posting this at the CLAP Atom. CLAP is clean aperture. They're ignored by FFmpeg. Um, then I guess this was probably, yeah, because it's owned by Steve Lom. Um, support pixel crop values in Matroska. And then I remember um, Agate, um, um, I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to pronounce the, their surname right, but in No Time to Wait 2 had an amazing um, uh, talk about uh, players. And I think this was one of the key bits of why, why they wanted to keep um, an older version of QuickTime Player around. You could turn off the cropping, um, which was quite useful. And so I was hoping to um, maybe try and get this introduced into Matroska. And there's some more. So the outcome of it was um, that like, maybe we're not going to migrate to FFU and Matroska for these. Like, just keep them as they are. And instead, maybe focus on trying to improve the open source environments that will decode and display these tools. So I think that um, any issue that I would have described there, it can be fixed in FFmpeg, it can be fixed in VLC, and we can have a much better environment um, to actually retain our ProRes um, files. And actually, I've mostly been talking about issues with the MOV container, um, uh, specifically. So, but we want to kind of get all this kind of ironed out for us before delving too deep into ProRes. I have very little interest now anymore in um, normalizing ProRes. That's just like, like with maybe DV, just leave it as is. Um, so yeah, so maybe that's the lesson here. Like when you, when you run into something and it doesn't quite work or something seems wrong, maybe take that extra step to report the issue, figure out what part you can play in fixing it. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to find some funding to fix this, but we may not. So if anyone wants to jump ahead of us and pay FFmpeg and VLT developers to do this, fire ahead, it would be great. And you can give a talk maybe at the next No Time to Wait about how you did that. Um, so that's that. Um, any questions? I probably have no time. Um, yeah. There's time for one question. Cool. Yes, Peter. Hey. Thank you. Great. Very interesting. Um, the only thing I was asking, uh, how do you deal with that 
actually there is no legally official legal ProRes decoder except for the black box. Yeah. As but a I'm preservation mean, format, like when you, when you say, okay, let's keep ProRes as it is. Yeah. But you didn't mention that there is, it's a black box, except for the other Kieran's reverse engineered decoder. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, is there particular issues with the open source decoder right now? No, no, no technical yeah. issues. It's yeah. perfectly fine. It's just that legally it's in a gray zone. Yeah, but I mean, I think so far in a way, I think Apple have been pretty hands off. I think there's been no, I think there might have been some secret discussions with FFmpeg developers from what I understand that um, I'm not sure, I'm going to look for any shakes at the heads that I should stop talking now. But I believe that when the decoder was originally released or maybe the encoder that maybe some Apple developers got in touch and said, you're doing a few things wrong and here's how you should fix it. Is maybe my, um, I think it's a compromise that we're willing to take anyway. Um, okay. It's, I would rather retain it as is right now. Um, I am, apart from some of the issues described here, I'm pretty happy with the way that we can decode it. Um, and so in future, hopefully, it would be a better situation. Maybe Apple will release an open source decoder. It'll never happen. Okay. But it'd be cool. Thank okay. you. Cheers. Thank you.